Call the October 27th, 2015 Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals meeting to order. Uh, the first order of business is to approve minutes from past meetings. I think the only past meeting that we have a quorum to approve the minutes is for the July 28th, 2015 meeting. Then we have a motion for the July 28th, 2015 meeting minutes. Move to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? So that's approved four to nothing. I'll abstain. Um, and uh, as far as the September 22nd, 2015 meeting minutes, uh, we do not have a quorum for that um, meeting. We don't have a quorum for the minutes of that meeting, so we will uh, save those for the next meeting. Um, we have no old business, so we'll move right into the new business. Um, the first order of new business, which is a continu which was continued from last meeting, is to hear the request continued from September 22nd, 2015, of Stephen and Anne Mr. Me? Misterovich. Thank you for a variance to construct an addition on the front of their home at 10 Beacon Lane, map U15, lot 64. The new construction is proposed to be 17 feet, 8 inches from the front property line, while the zoning ordinance requires 25 feet. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mastarevich. Uh, good evening, Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, try again tonight. Uh, my name is Steve Mastervich. I live at 10 Beacon Lane along with my wife and our three children, and we've lived there since 2001. I'm here to ask for a variance to construct an addition to the front of our house. We'd like to move uh, the kitchen out to the front. And moving it forward, it would give us um, views of the east or working lighthouse. We're basically caddy corner from the west light. Uh, our house was originally built in 68 or 69, and at that time there were no other homes in the area, so the house had a clear view of both lighthouses and uh, very good ocean views. When the original owner sold it, the next owner uh, became so upset because houses started to fill in and they blocked his view of the lighthouse. He went as far as trying to buy a lot next to the lighthouse and build a house and apparently was a, I found an article in the Historical Society about it and he, there was hundreds of people that signed a petition against it. He never got to build his house so he moved to Falmouth. Uh, our addition I don't think would have any natural environment effects as it's going to be built on flat ground grass. There's some uh, foundation plantings that would be moved. There's no trees um, that would be uh, disturbed. Um, as far as the character of the neighborhood, uh, Beacon Lane is a mix of architectural styles, sizes, uh, so I don't think our addition uh, would appear to be out of place. Uh, nor do I think it would uh, ruin any of Butter's views, cast any shadows, or have any detrimental effects on any of Butter's. Um, significant economic injury. Um, I did a survey, which I handed out in the last packet, of the land values of Beacon Lane. Now, Beacon Lane basically is two different parts. The western part of Beacon Lane is 10 foot wide. Uh, most of the lots are over an acre. Where East Beacon Lane, the houses are all about uh, half an acre. But if you look at the dollar value on the uh, east, it's considerably more, even though the lots are uh, half the size. So I believe if we are allowed to construct this addition, and to be able to have uh, better ocean views and views of the lighthouse, that it would increase the value uh, of our home. 
Uh, when I was here last month, um, there was a request for our deed, which I presented. And there was questions about where our property lines end. Beacon Lane is a private road, and there is a right-of-way. I've included some uh, deeds from other properties highlighted that show that there was a right-of-way. And as far as I can tell, the right-of-way started in 1828 when the U.S. government bought the land in that area from Farmer Dyer and built the lighthouse. The government sold the land in 1959, so I don't know if that right-of-way expires or it stays. So when we had the survey done, the property originally our deeds that was 361 feet deep. When the survey was done, they gave me a figure of 356 feet on that side. So that's uh, 10 feet short of the road. So there's a question on who owns the right of way. Do I own the 10 feet of grass that I cut every week? Uh, and our surveyor told me it cost a lot of money and a lot of time to try and figure any of that out. So if there's any uh, questions about uh, what I've presented or the information that I've presented. I have a couple. Um, you've given us this chart. Yes. Um, it shows your, your number 10 being lame, correct? Correct. So these guys to the east of you are the ones that were subsequently built? Yes. But before you bought your own land? Excuse me? They were all built before you bought your property? Yes, prior to me owning right. it, yes. I mean, they were there when you bought into it? Yes. Um, just, just so I understand this chart. So yours, these, all the eastern ones are listed to having a lighthouse view and ocean views. Yours is too. It's the only one of the western ones that already has. Okay. If I may, the west lighthouse I have a view of. The east is blocked by the other houses. And one thing I neglected to mention is there's one house which is across the street which is part of the east Beacon Lane whose land value is less than ours. I know the person, I've been in the house. They have no views of the east light. Um, my neighbor told me they used to have views, the light came right in the house, and somebody added on to the back of the house, and now that view is gone. And even though they're right next to the west light, because the west light is six feet from the road, and they're obviously back at least 25 feet, they really have no view. So. In, my opinion, that's why their land value is less than all the others and less than ours. So if I stood out on my front lawn and went out 18 feet, that's where the view of the light is. And that's why we're trying to get the 7 foot 8 variance to move the kitchen out front. But again, that was reflected in your purchase price when you bought it, correct? Sorry? Yeah, so I think what we're asking is what is the significant economic injury if you purchased your home based on what was there, it was already there. I'm just saying that if I was able to move out, that would increase the value. Like my neighbors whose house was there and had the view, and now the view is gone, and I don't think she fought against this addition. So now I believe she has economic loss, but. Any other questions? Thank you. Any public comment? And Ben, did we receive any 
public comment or letters? We received one comment in support of the application. Okay. And all the abutters were notified? Yes. Okay. Um, hearing no public comment, um, I'd just like to open it up for board discussion. Um, I'd like to echo kind of what I'm hearing, at least from a couple of the questions. I'm a little bit um, concerned about the lack of economic injury, um, at least in terms of the, uh, you know, variance applications we've seen before. It, it's usually a variance to allow a structure that would be in along the lines of what's in the neighborhood. Um, and I'm not hearing that here, necessarily. So there's, there's two, two issues that come up between uh, the last hearing that we had and, and today. And what is the, the comparison between this type of variance with, for example, where someone has a house that does not have a garage. So they bought the house without the garage, but now they want the garage. Um, so that's something similar to this application where you bought the house with marginal views and then over time there's some build up there. So that there is a value that uh, can be improved in their house if they have the, the variance and have a better view to improve um, the, the use and value of their home, similar to a garage. Uh, and then on this data here is that, from my understanding, is that this was showing that there's a, a, a difference between houses that have a view that does not. So if the board members are saying that there is a, you buy what you get, and that's that, or you consider this more like a garage concept, is that they bought it without the, the views, uh, and now they wish to have a view. I'm looking at this chart, and what I'm seeing is that most of the west lots do not have a view. And so the west lots generally don't have a view, and the east lots do. It's, it's a little bit different, at least kind of, my, my initial take is it's a little bit different from a garage where there are some houses on lots that have garages in a neighborhood and others that don't. This is generally the houses on the west side of the street don't have views and the ones on the east do. That's not to say that the ones on the on the west side couldn't be all improved to have use. I'm not sure, but and, and I'm not. And, and again, this this isn't necessarily something that we would be taking into consideration. But are we gonna? Is there now going to be everybody on the east side, on the west side is going to be improving their home to get views? I mean, it, there's a bit of a slippery slope that I think we might be heading down if we approve this variance. So that, that is the, the same slippery slope that when we deal with garages on, on a neighborhood that over time a garage has built up, it's progress. And so over time, uh, more homes, homes have a garage. So there's, there's no doubt there's a slippery slope, hence the variance issue. I mean, and you're right, each one, each, just because you grant one variance doesn't mean that a variance would be appropriate for each home on the east side, I'm sorry, on the west side of, of Beacon Lane. I, presumably, they'd have to apply, apply for a variance and it would have to meet all the other requirements. Uh, yeah, I a couple of things. One is, the garage is kind of an all or nothing situation. I mean, they've been living in Maine in this house for X years. They'd like to have a garage in their dotage. I, speak from experience. Um, I think the view is an enhancement of the view, which they already have by their own account, number one. Number two, what we're talking about here is the last seven feet. This isn't like they can't do an addition. There's a lot of room on the house to do an addition. This is about the last seven feet is where we're, that's, that's what's imposing on the set, and it's imposing very significant. It's not like 10 or 20%. I mean, it's, it's, it's imposing significantly into the setback. 
Another specific difference from the case you mentioned is that I think that's a side variance for the garage. So the immediate impact is really on the neighbors. I mean, this is in front. This comes right down the road, significantly farther down the road into the setback. So I think from my point of view, from a precedent point of view, I would think this is saying, gee, um, all these other properties were built. Zoning was put into place to say, we don't really want neighborhoods to look like this anymore. Now we have what we want to improve our view, so we want to have an addition that's not just a 10-foot addition, but it's a 17-foot addition, so we can really come down in there. That's right in the front on the street. I mean, that's, what is your criteria going to be when anybody else comes in and says, gee, I want to improve my view. This is what I bought, this is what I've been living with. It's not a necessity. It would just make it nicer. So, what what is the point of the zoning? At some point? Uh, two points. Uh, the first is that is there a significance here on these facts that there's a private road, not a public road in front? And the second part is that the the, the applicant still has to demonstrate there is a loss of value of some sort. Whereas, for example, the neighborhood has developed over time and that that house has been left as it originally was. And so that may not be the case that we have here in that it, it's just the circumstances of the lot. So e what I'm saying is that each applicant would on uh, the west side of that street would still have to meet, come before us and, and demonstrate that there's an economic loss. It's not an easy process to get a variance. So, so he just, they just get the spreadsheet and just come back to us with the same exact argument and we say, oh yeah, sure. <clears throat> I think the comparison to a garage is not necessarily a, a good one because when we've granted them for that, there's, you know, in 1952B, uh, D, um, no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the practitioner. Um, a lot of these, garage issues are on small lots that have setback issues that, you know, there's a lineup of houses and one doesn't have a garage, so they, put, they want to put one in, but they're going, you know, five feet over a setback, that sort of thing. These people have plenty of room to build their kitchen. They have a, a, a pretty good sized lot they can go out the back hundred feet, hundreds of feet, um, or the side, or wherever. Um, there's, there is a practical alternative to their addition of making more usable space in the kitchen and so forth. What about um, the significant economic injury definition includes um, standards with, which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners? Are there 10 property owners that have a view? I mean, is that the standard that we're applying? And Mr. Chair, what's the, where's the section of this? I, I'm just reading it out of the, the application, but it's in, um, sorry. Uh, page two at the top. What's that? It's a page two of the application yeah. at the bottom. Page two. I'm sorry, page three, the middle. I mean, just, just looking at the chart, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven houses that have these. So just you know, and I, I think this is sort of, at least in my mind, sort of crystallizing what I see as the problem with, with this type of variance, which is being done for a view, 
it's, I mean, the language is comparable in size, location, and number. And what they're asking for is, is a variance to allow construction that will provide them with a view. An improved, an improved view where the, the significant economic injury language, we're supposed to be looking at the, the size location of the structure. And I'm not, even if I were inclined to grant a variance based on, to, to provide an enhanced view, don't we need to compare how the structure looks? It's giving them a view, but how does this variance affect the neighborhood? And how does you know this encroachment on the um, boundary line look compared with the other structures? So we're, we're kind of we're talking about what what it's giving them is a view, but when we're looking at variances, we're usually comparing the size of structures on lots and. You know, other, uh, for example, when we often consider a, uh, a garage, we're looking at where other garages sit on lots. And here, I don't have any, um, any pictures or any evidence to see where, how other houses sit on lots and how close they encroach and do any of them encroach into setbacks. The testimony last, uh, the last meeting was that, that basically there is a, a private way that has a private right way that the Beacon Lane runs through, but they are not, the houses are not equidistant from the actual lane. So there's, a, let's say, a straight line, a property line, and then the, the lane kind of meanders down below it. So their home appears to be further back than other homes, was the testimony we heard about. So it wouldn't necessarily be a character in the neighborhood. And one of the other documents that was provided at the first time around is that there's a list of properties with the frontage from the from the street or the setback. Roughly similar uh, numbers with the various um, incorporated. So we're not I'm talking completely out of character with the neighborhood, plus the private street, plus the, the meandering aspect of that being the lane. Um, but I agree that there's a slippery slope element here, uh, and that if we're looking particularly at that provision dealing with the Definition for significant economic injury. They say no fewer than 10 properties that meet a similar requirement. So there is some data that would support the variance, but not, I don't think, to the level that's going to be of a comfort value that there should be a variance for this particular property. Certainly, there, as compared to the other properties in this neighborhood, there is this house and pro uh, location seems to be. I want to say disadvantage, but somewhat different uh, than the other homes in the area for the purposes of the view. I do agree that uh, the kitchen and views can go out the side and the back. What's wrong with that? Well, there's a preference to have the view of one of the lighthouses.
Chair, I have a question as well. Uh, on the material that was submitted, there's a findings of facts. I have, I'm troubled with a couple of line items here because I don't think it reflects the testimony that was in our, also our discussion. Um, so I'm on number three and four, I don't think the, the test has been met for those two. Okay, I mean, I, my view would be most, I mean, it, it obviously depends which way we're yes. going, but yes. um, I view those findings, we would generally be findings that we would be making if we're approving, granting the variance. Yes. I guess maybe we should get a general sense. Are, are we moving in that direction? I, I'm inclined to deny it. I am also. I didn't hear what you I'm, said. I'm inclined to deny that. I am also. Well, that's three. That's three. <laughs> So, um, would one of the three of us like to make a motion? Oh, I'll move to decline the motion. Move to deny the variance? Whatever it is, yes. Let's get a uh, So the motion would be to deny the request of Stephen and Anne Mr. Rich, for a variance to construct an addition on the front of their home at 10 Beacon Lane, map U15, lot 64, the new construction <coughs> is proposed to be 17 feet 8 inches from the front property line while the zoning ordinance requires 25 feet. Okay, so the motion would be a motion to deny the request of Stephen and Ann Mistrovich for a variance to construct an addition on the front of their home at 10 Beacon Lane, map U15, lot 64. The new construction is proposed to be 17 feet, eight inches from the front property line well, the zoning ordinance requires 25 feet. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. So I have four in favor and all opposed? All right, so the uh, request for a variance is denied four to one. Um, in terms of additional, find uh, so the findings of fact uh, would be Stephen and Ann Mistrovich are the owners of record of the property located at 10 Beacon Lane, map U15, lot 64. The subject property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. The zoning ordinance section 19-4-3A1A requires the front setback to be 25 feet. The proposed expansion of the principal structure will be 17 feet 8 inches from the front property line. Um, I mean, these additional findings are all, I mean, they're not findings that, they are, they're all findings in support of the variance, so I don't think we would be making those findings. Um, then do we need to make any other findings that we're denying? Do we need to make findings in the, in the negative for these? Yes. Okay. Um, so the additional findings, I guess here, here's, here's additional findings that I would propose. Um, the need for a variance is not due to the unique circumstances of the property. The need for a variance is not due to the unique circumstances of the property and to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Um, so I don't think we really discussed two. And they don't all need to right. be negative. You're, if, if any of them are negative, that, it, it fails. Okay. Um, well, which, hold on, I can make this quick.
I mean, the big one, at least in my mind, was the practical difficulty and, and the language which follows from that, which is a significant economic injury. So, I mean, we have to find that there's a practical difficulty for there to be a variance, to approve a variance. So, um, so the Zoning Board of Appeals may grant variances from the terms of the ordinance provided that there is a substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance and a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause practical difficulty. So the additional finding that I would propose is that um, a literal enforcement of the ordinance in this case would not cause practical difficulty as defined by 30 AM RSA 4353 4C. You have a, a not there which suggests that you are in favor of the variance. Can you restate say that please? Yes. Thank you. Um, a literal enforcement of the ordinance would not cause practical difficulty. If it would cause practical mm -hmm. difficulty, that's correct. The not should be in there. Okay. Um, so again, the, the additional findings of fact is a literal enforcement of the ordinance would not cause practical difficulty as defined by 30 AMRSA 4353 4C. I think we can leave it at that. Um, all in favor of that additional, the, all in favor of the findings of fact and the additional findings of fact. Okay. So that's five nothing. So you're, you're striking one through six and just adding the one you just stated? Correct. Okay. All right, so the um, request for a variance is denied. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for the members. Okay, moving on to item number two which is to hear the administrative appeal of Apple Tree Cottage, LLC, regarding the code enforcement officer's decision to approve building permit 150525. The building permit is for two accessory structures at 15 Sunrise Drive, map U14, lot 38. Um, before we start this, uh, one of the parties in this case is represented by um, attorney Schutz. I used to work with him at uh, Pretty Flaherty. I don't believe this would in any way impact um, my findings or decisions in this. Um, so I don't believe I need to refuse myself, but I do just want to make that known. Um, I also want to make known that uh, I live on Hennepin Cove Road, which is one of the streets next to um, Sunrise Terrace. Um, sorry, Sunrise Drive. Um, I do not know the party seeking uh, the building permit, but I do know the owner of the Apple Tree Cottage LLC. Um, he's a resident on Hannibal Cove Road. Um, if there's an issue for my being on this board, let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I could sit out in the audience if there's a conflict. To me, as long as you feel like you can be impartial, it doesn't sound like okay. it's a problem. Um, I guess I'd like to just start this with Ben, since it's um, an appeal of administrative of appeal of a permit, if you could just give us some background um, regarding the permit that you issued. On August 21st, 2015, I approved a building permit for two accessory structures. They are 12 feet by 12 feet, two separate accessory structures and uh, the proposed use for the structures is bedrooms. And, uh, uh, and then I had correspondence um, with the owner of Apple Tree Cottage, LLC. Um, and we uh, had some correspondence and he disagreed with my finding that those should be allowed as accessory structures and subsequently filed an appeal. Chair, I have a point of order. Um, my understanding is that the gentleman, um, Apple Tree LLC is appealing, right? So he's not the owner of the land. He's in a butter, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Um, Attorney Schutz for Apple Tree Cottage. Thank you and good evening. My name is Sigmund Schutz. I'm an attorney for Apple Tree Cottage LLC, which is the appellant and an abutter to this property. Uh, the question before the board is whether two additional one bedroom cubes are clearly incidental to a one bedroom cottage. Our position is that you can't be incidental to yourself. Essentially, it's more house. It's not incidental to the house. An additional bedroom, these two additional bedrooms would essentially triple the amount of guest space at this property from a one bedroom cottage to a three bedroom rental property. We don't believe that's clearly incidental to the existing use. It's an expansion of the existing use. It in effect is the existing use tripled. The um, ordinance, uh, the Cape Elizabeth ordinance, uh, and there's uh, gives many indications that commercial non-residential uses in the RA zone are to be looked upon with skepticism, if not disfavor. There's concern about short-term rental uses in this zone. An ordinance was passed to regulate that particular use. There are restrictions on motel uses, on boarding house uses. If you want to have a bed and breakfast use in this zone, which would be occupied by the owner, you've got to have 60,000 square feet, in other words, 20,000 square feet per bedroom. So we believe that there's plenty of intent there, to the extent there's ambiguity in the Cape Elizabeth ordinance that would suggest that these types of expansions of commercial rental uses should be uh, limited and looked on uh, skeptically. The practical effect of allowing these two additional one bedroom cubes, uh, as Mr. Bond refers to them, is that they um, are essentially adding additional dwelling space closer to the property line that would be allowed if the house were expanded. In other words, this house could be expanded, but if it's expanded, it's subject to a 25 foot setback. As interpreted by um, code enforcement, these accessory structures are only subject to a 15 foot setback. So what we end up with by allowing these types of accessory uses are bedrooms with 10 feet closer to the property line than would otherwise be permissible if Mr. Bond took the decision to simply expand his house. Um, we think that creates less privacy for neighbors, that creates noise issues for neighbors, that creates light issues for neighbors, and is incompatible with the ordinance. These um, accessory structures, as we understand it from the application, are proposed to be accompanied by with uh, exterior showers. We have some concerns about having additional bedrooms that don't have bathrooms. We have some concern with allowing these types of accessory structures without any um, uh, connection to the, the capability of a septic system to handle the amount of wastewater that may be generated by additional bedrooms if they're permitted by, via these accessory, potentially mobile structures. Um, in short, we think the practical effect um, of allowing these kinds of additional tripling of bedrooms via accessory structures would be contrary to the purposes of the ordinance and cause problems. If there's any concern about allowing this structure, um, is a, an accessory to a residential owner-occupied use, then the zoning board should direct that it, the permit be conditioned on that use. So that we don't have a precedent that says, well, short-term rental uh, renters can start adding cubes out back to expand the number of guest rooms um, without limit. Um, we've also questioned the setback determination. Um, basically, for non-conforming lots, there's a chart, section 19.4.3, that uh, has a list of setbacks applicable to structures on non-conforming lots. The setback, side setback per that chart in uh, section 19.4.3 is 25 feet. Therefore, we've questioned why uh, this, uh, these are approved with a 20-foot setback. Um, be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Any questions at this time? I would point out two facts for the record. Uh, the septic system was upgraded to a three-bedroom septic system and newly installed 
uh, to account for the wastewater possible from, from these new structures. And, uh, and I'm not aware of any outside showers, uh, nor am I, am I sure they'd be allowed if they meet the plumbing code. So, two points on water. I have. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to understand something here. The expansion could have taken place in the house, but wouldn't if you're sort of suggesting it wouldn't have been able to meet code on the lot if they put two more bedrooms in the house? Did I understand that correctly? No, I'm suggesting if you expand the house, you're subject to a 25-foot setback. But if you put one of these bedrooms in a cube, you can put it within 15 feet per the code enforcement officer's determination. Okay, but you could expand the, the house on that lot. Sure, and that would be very compatible with the neighborhood. If you want to have a slightly larger cottage, that's one thing. If we want to put exterior cubes out back and have people um, living in units or renting units that have no facilities out back on lots, that to us is a problem as a neighbor. We think that would impact our property value and also add, well, it would triple the level of use of the property. We don't think under the ordinance is clearly incidental to the primary use. It's a tripling of the primary use. If they had come in, a, in with this exact same footprint and called one of them garden shed and the other one a playhouse, an outside playhouse for children, what objections would you have had? We have, would have no concerns with that. Again. If we look at the definition of accessory structure in the ordinance, we're talking about uses that are not customarily and typically contained within the primary structure. So the definition of accessory building or structure, garage, gazebo, greenhouse, uh, pool, tennis court, wharf, dock, landing, or boathouse, what do those all have in common? They're not primary uses of the main structure, typically in Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, I understand. So if they'd labeled the application different, you wouldn't have had a problem. Right. Structures could have been exactly the same, correct? To, to qualify as an accessory building or structure per the definition, the use has to be clearly incidental. Okay. So if a use was an outdoor playhouse for children so they can go and raise a ruckus and don't disrupt the household, and yet there's a garden shed, those would qualify, correct? Correct. So the structures could be exactly the same. Possibly with the exception of the exterior shower. Well, if you've been out gardening, you might want to shower before you come in the house. And if the kids have been carrying on, they might want to shower before you bring them in the house. Yeah, you might have a shower associated with a swimming pool. I would agree. I mean, it seems to me it's a tricky business to say that, you know, if these applicants, it's a fairly simple ploy to have changed the wording, since you don't have to change the structure at all to meet the requirement as you've defined it. I think for that reason, it would be important if this were permitted to condition the use going forward, such that we're not looking at uses that replicate the use of the primary structure. Okay, and, and how do you enforce that? I mean, that's a matter of moving furniture. You know, it would be the same type of enforcement that would be applicable to any structure. But again, the definition of an accessory building or structure hinges on the use being incidental. Thus, you've got to look at the use. So, so if it's a property that has one bathroom and it's in the main house, and these are just wooden boxes out there without their own plumbing, without bathrooms, how are they not incidental to the, to the use of the main structure? They be, can't, they're not their own dwelling units. They're not dwelling units because they don't have a bedroom, a kitchen, and, um, and, and, you know, but they're being used as bedrooms. And the primary use of the structure is as, as a bedroom so, use. So if the offending cube were moved so that it isn't, so it actually uh, uh, conforms with the, the correct, what you see as a correct setback, would that solve the problem? No, that's a separate independent issue in terms of what setback should apply to an accessory, a new accessory structure on a non-conforming lot. Could the applicant renovate the existing cottage to add a bedroom? Sure. 
And that's what he ought to do. If he wants to have additional bedroom, then comply well, you, with the setbacks and the requirements to renovate your existing right. building. But you said that that would sub uh, make him conform with the different setback, the 25-foot setback. Right. What I'm saying is why do, can he renovate the way he's renovating or adding the way he's adding, but still conform to that setback, but just have there be different, different buildings? Oh, could he possibly move the cubes back right. so they're 25 foot feet from the neighbor? Right. Probably he could. That wasn't what was proposed. Okay. One, of, one of the definitions or, or one of the included but not limited to um, examples of an accessory building or structure is a home workshop. Um, and that's defined in the ordinance as a workshop located within a principal building or within an accessory building, which is used primarily by the occupants of the dwelling unit for personal use and not a commercial use. And I guess just the, the concern that I'm having is I'm hearing that this is going to be used, you know, this is for sleeping, this is for sleeping, these are additional bedrooms. That's not what um, the owners of the property are saying. And there just, there seems to be this gray area with what, how are these structures going to be used? And, you know, some of, some of the explanation for how these structures are going to be used coming from the uh, property owner sounds to me like it could be a workshop type of use. So uh, where do we draw that line? Sure. I think one way to draw that line is to condition the future use of these cubes so that they don't become bedrooms. In other words, uh, I think the, the more, uh, and so that you've, precluded the use of the thing for an improper purpose, for a non-incidental purpose. Um, I think in terms of whether they're bedrooms or not, I mean, the face of the application says existing number of existing bedrooms, one, proposed bedrooms, two. You've heard from the code enforcement officer that the septic system has been upgraded for the additional bedrooms. Um, the drawing attached to the permit application shows an outdoor shower attached to each one of these units. Um, it's labeled outdoor shower. So, uh, you know, the, uh, in the, the, uh, the submission from the owner seems to say, well, look, they're not only going to be bedrooms, they may be other things. Well, if that's the case, then look, let's condition this that they're not going to be used as bedrooms. And you can use that for other permissible purposes as proposed. Um, the, the other side of it, though, is you can't say, well, we're going to put in this structure and we're going to use it for anything we feel like using it for. Any possible use that we may make of this structure going forward will necessarily be incidental. I don't think you can have it both ways. Well, you, you got a primary use and an incidental use. There's a divide between those two. So you can't say, well, we're going to use it for anything we feel like using it for and take the position that that's necessarily clearly incidental. I mean, I think if the applicant wants to come back and say, look, we want to use, this is a workshop use. It's not going to be used as sleeping quarters. This is not going to be put to a, you know, rental type of commercial use, a non-residential use under your ordinance. That's fine. Then let's have an approval granted on that basis. But what the applicant has come to the code enforcement officer for is, let's take a one-bedroom cottage, triple it to a three-bedroom rental. That's just not clear, you know, again, just, your definition of an accessory use, it's not clearly incidental. And the, and the ordinance uses the word clearly, which means unmistakable, free from doubt. It's hard to argue that this isn't the primary use expanded threefold. Okay. Um, it seems to me, in a way above all, what we want from people is that they come to us in good faith. And these people have. Um, and it seems to me your resting so heavily on the clearly incidental language invites gamesmanship. I mean, as I say, th what's tricky about this whole section, I think, is that it's not like it's a 25-foot setback and we're going to allow three feet because otherwise they can't build a garage. To it. Or it's 25% coverage and it's, you know, it's quantitative. There's nothing quantitative here. Um, as I said, the structure, one structure can, you know, the same structure could be a garden shed, which is okay. It could be a greenhouse, which is okay. It could be 
a bedroom, which you say is not okay, but that's just a matter of which furniture you move in and out after you own it. I mean, it seems to me we have to deal with, Ben has these people walking into his office. We want them to be candid. And we want somehow to have this work. And it seems to me it's like somehow this is, you know, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and talks like a duck, Ben has to say it's a duck. And I, I just, I have, I have a real problem if, if you can, if the whole issue you can flip it, flip it away with a, with a change of labels, there's something wrong with our decision. I guess what I would say is uh, your ordinance contains lots of indications that additional dwelling, habitable space, accessory dwelling units, guest rooms, which are defined with the motel definition, boarding rooms, bedrooms with B&Bs, all of these uses which add to the sleeping quarters on a, on a um, property are defined. Many of them are prohibited. Many of them are subject to uh, additional application requirements. This is not, a, I would suggest, on the edge. This is adding, making a one-bedroom rental a three-bedroom rental. Toilet facilities are also a primary component of a dwelling unit, but it's relatively common for someone to put toilet facilities in an accessory structure. And it's actually relatively common for people to create additional living space in accessory structures. There's a lot of precedent in Cape Elizabeth for people putting additional living space, whether it's overflow sleeping areas, uh, playrooms, uh, bathrooms in a workshop, uh, there's a lot of precedent in Cape Elizabeth for people taking components of a dwelling unit and having them in accessory buildings. I can say is I'm not aware of any prior appeals that have plumbed this issue or addressed this issue, but your ordinance says the use uh, speaks to a use being clearly incidental and related to the principal building. Um, I could imagine a situation where you might say, well, look, we can't get an expansion of our, our, our house uh, put in, so we're going to have three cubes. One's going to be a bedroom, one's going to be a kitchen, one's going to be a bathroom. It's not a, it's not a new dwelling unit. These are all permissible accessory structures. We're going to have about, f and there's no limit on accessory structures under your words. How about five extra bath uh, bedrooms out back for a short-term rental property? Permissible? Or are those not replicating the primary use of the structure, particularly for a rental that's a sleeping quarters? Uh, I had a follow-up question. Is, is the issue that you can put one of these cubes within the setback of 15 feet? Or what happens if there's plenty of space to build five cubes, for example, uh, and then it's within the overarching setback, so it's, it's, I think it's 30 feet on the sides and 25 feet in the front. Would, would you, um, a, a, sorry, would your client object to that issue? I think my suggestion to you there is that um, we don't want people putting bedrooms closer to 25 feet from the property line, and it would be with this accessory uh, cubes, that, bedroom cubes that are being proposed, we can put bedrooms 15 feet from the property line. In fact, neighbors, if permissible, would be able to put those on either side of the property line, so 20 foot closer than would otherwise be permitted. If you're going to expand your existing structure, you've got to say within 25 feet of the property line, which enhances privacy, you know, it addresses light and noise types of issues. So if I'm a neighbor. I like the fact that the near nearest bedroom to my property is another 10 feet away. and what this uh, application is saying is we'd like to push that considerably closer to the boundary. Any other questions at this time? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I guess could we next hear from the bonds? <coughs> Good evening. My name is Chris Bond, and uh, my wife and I own 15 Sunrise Drive. It's a 24 foot by 28 foot structure. And I just thought I'd give you a little sense of scale. 
I looked online today, and uh, the, the Census Bureau says that in 2010, which was the latest data that I could find, the average size house in the Northeast that was constructed in 2010 was 2,600 square feet. That doesn't fit within this, this floor area, so I went for the average U.S. Uh, structure, which is 2,400 square feet. And imagine if, if you take this wall that's at your backs, and you go from this wall to that wall, and then all the way back to the exterior wall of this, uh, of this uh, floor, that's about 2,600, I'm sorry, 2,400 square feet. So I measured, I measured it up. That's the average that goes all the way back to the exterior wall. This ribbon going from the back wall to here represents the size of the structure we're talking about. And if you add on the two structures that are being appealed tonight, it can go back to this ribbon here. So when SIG says that it's going to triple, excuse me. When SIG says that it's going to triple the size of the structure, clearly it's not. We're moving from that yellow ribbon to that yellow ribbon. And even with the additional structures, we'll be at 40% of the average single family structure built in 2010 in the United States. 40%. Now, SIG seems to uh, suggest that what I really should have done was torn the building down. And ironically, that's exactly what my contractor suggested I do. He said, for the amount of money you're going to spend, Chris, you're going to get a much bigger structure. These are, we call this house the matchbox because it's so little. And it's right next door to another matchbox, which is very tiny. They're half acre lots, little tiny houses, They've been there since about 1960. And both of them were fully depreciated. There was not much left uh, to save. But they had been there since 1960. They're, they're sort of the uncaped Elizabeth house, if you will. And for that reason, they kind of appealed to, appealed to my wife and I. And uh, we went to our architect, and he said, you shouldn't tear this house down. You should save it. You know, there's things you can do without s destroying the original character of the house. And it's not like there's some big architectural thing to them. They're, it's not a particularly beautiful house, but it, but it is nice. And if I, just to give you a sense of how big it is, um, also, if I, if I stood here, that's it. And this is, so this is the bedroom right here. It's about 11 feet by 11 feet. And then there's a little bathroom that's about like so. And then there's a laundry room. And over here is the kitchen. A little eating area in this corner. And then this is, we're in the living room right here. That's how big it is. And so, you couldn't leave it the way it is. We had to replace the doors. We had to replace the roof. We had to reside it. We replaced all the windows. We reinsulated it completely to modern standards. We replaced all the interior walls with pine. We put in a whole new electrical service. We rebuilt the well, put in a new well pump, rewired all the outlets and lights, replaced all the lights, replaced all the plumbing fixtures except for the toilet, replaced the whole septic system. And after spending all that money, we still had a 672-square-foot house. One bedroom. A big enough house for, at most, two people. Now, SIG seems to understand, or his client seems to understand, exactly how we're going to use this property. If he does, he knows more than I do. Now, short term, I live on uh, Route 77, just by the ball field. I don't know where I'm going to be in the next five years. If I listen to my wife, we're going to probably be down on Sunrise Drive. I don't know what we're going to do. But whatever we do, this house will be nice enough that I would want to live there. 
I wouldn't want to be associated with it if it wasn't that nice. Seg is arguing that this is going to be a full-time three-bedroom house. It's not the case. This house is not big enough to support three full-time bedrooms. It's big enough to support one bedroom as it has for the last 50 years, and then overflow space from time to time as people come and go. That's all it is. If we live there, it's going to be when family and friends come. The cubes were not designed to be bedroom only. They're designed, yes, to accommodate sleeping. That's why we told Ben, you know, we want to put in a new septic system. We want to have the freedom to use three spaces, three bedrooms. So we put in a three bedroom system. But home entertainment, home office, hobbies, general living space, these, these cubes will fulfill all of those things. When it's finished, 15 Sunrise Drive will not be a motel, as Apple Tree has asserted. When it's finished, it will be used in conformity with all of the zoning laws. Ben will make sure of that. As I stated in my brief, Apple Tree spills a fair bit of ink trying to make the case that our effort to build the 12 foot by 12 foot rooms is just the first step on our way to the next Motel 6 in Hannaford Cove. Suffice it to say that your denial of Apple Tree's appeal this evening will not put the whole Hannaford Cove area on a slippery slope to large scale commercial development that left unchecked by the board will lead to unimaginable urban pains. Apple Tree's suggestion of the contrary are of course complete and utter, utter nonsense. Uh, I own uh, another property right up and over the hill on Two Lights Road. I've rented that since I moved here in 1980. It has continuously been improved. It is way better than when I bought it. It continues to be improved. One does not invest in a small 672 square foot house with aspirations of building a commercial motel, come what may of these cubes. The house has been seasonally rented for most of the past 13 years by the previous owners. I don't think anybody in that area would argue that that's been harmful to the neighborhood. So despite the fact that my wife and I have no firm decisions about the long-term use of this property, including living there ourselves, even if it was used for seasonal rentals, it would have no more of a detrimental effect upon the area that has been in place for the last 10 years, even with the cubes. Apple Tree's arguments that the 12 by 12 foot structures are not clearly incidental and related to that of the principal building or use of the land is misplaced and an unreasonable interpretation of the ordinance. Apple Tree cites a vacated superior court case to make the legal argument that because sleeping is also a primary or main use of the house as it currently is, it, is, it therefore cannot be by definition an incidental use. Sleeping is sleeping, but I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that the primary sleeping space will be inside the main structure. That's where the bathroom is. That's where the refrigerator is. That's where the washer and dryer is. That's the clear, obvious space for the place sleeping to take place. Sleeping will not take place outside of the main structure, except as needed on an incidental and variable basis. Apple Tree's argument that the 12 by 12 foot structures do not qualify as accessory structures because they are used exclusively or primarily for sleeping may be a correct argument in a different case, where the primary structure lacks any sleeping space at all. And I would agree with Sig. If the primary, if we took the sleeping space out of the primary structure and converted it all to living, and then move the sleeping outside, I think you have his argument. But that's not the case here. We are keeping the footprint of the primary structure as exactly as it was. The primary sleeping space will remain in the primary structure. Incidental sleeping use, recreate uh, home office use, photography, that will go outside. 
if the house did not provide sleeping accommodations, oh, I'm sorry, uh, in support of its arguments, Appletree cites Lane Construction Corp versus Town of Washington as authority for the rule that for a use to be incidental, it must not be the primary use of the property, but rather one that is subordinate and minor in significance. The authority cited for this rule is a Superior Court case that held in relevant part that because a rock crusher is a primary part of mineral extraction, it cannot be an accessory use to mineral extraction. I don't know how that was cited for this fact pattern. However, uh, that case was vacated by the Supreme Judicial Court of Maine, where the court found in Lane Construction Court versus Town of Washington, even though the terms of the zoning ordinance are defined by the court as a matter of law, whether or not the proposed structure or use meets the definition of the application thereof may be a matter of fact for the initial board determination. It, and if you find as a matter of fact that the uses I've described are incidental, that determination will be respected by the courts unless it is clearly erroneous. Applying that rule, the Supreme Judicial Court of Maine reversed the holding of the Superior Court opinion cited by Apple Tree and instead upheld the Planning Board's decision that rock, rock, rock crushing was permitted even though it was integral to the primary use of the property, that being mineral extraction. Therefore, under the Lane Construction Corp, as cited by Apple Tree, even though sleeping is integral to the principal use of the primary structure, this Board of Appeals may find as a factual matter that sleeping is a permitted use even though it goes hand in hand with the principal use. Further, although sleeping is the same no matter where it is done, the primary sleeping space is being served and will be served by the principal structure. The cubes will only serve as sleeping space when the primary structure's capacity is inadequate. I will stop there. Are there any questions? I have one little question. Where is the bathroom? The bathroom is in the main structure, in the primary. Oh, you mean, in, well, just, uh, the bathroom just is, so here's the bedroom. Here's the corner. So I'm in the bedroom. Here's the bathroom. 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 Right next, uh, accessible only from the bedroom. It's accessible only from the bedroom? You have to go, you have to leave the living room, go into the bedroom, and then into the bathroom. So anybody in the outside structures has to come into the house and walk through the other bedroom? That was the case. However, what we did is we added a half bath and laundry. So there's a laundry room about where you're sitting. There's now a toilet there. Is that inside or outside? It's inside the main structure. So the half bathroom is now in the main structure is in the middle of the main structure is there, the there's main a there's so here's the living room uh, here's the bedroom and then the, the main full uh, it's a three-quarter bath and then if you went out around there was a laundry room right where you're sitting in that laundry room there's now a half bath so does that have an outside door it, it the outside door goes yes it goes out onto the deck Okay, but to take a shower or use a bath, you need to leave. If you were sleeping in the in the the outside structure, you have to walk across the lawn, go into the main house, go through a bedroom. That's correct. Bathroom. That's correct. Although the proposal has outdoor showers for both of the cubes. No. Okay. For one of them or neither of them. Okay. No. Mr. Vaughn, how how are the cubes anchored? They are on sauna tubes. They're what? They're on sauna tubes. Could you explain that to me? Oh, I'm sorry. They're on concrete posts. Okay. And, and are they heated? Yes, they will be. Uh, they're going to have, we're debating whether we put in gas or electric. It looks like we're going to put in electric heat. In, in your uh, written draft response that you provided, and I think you mentioned this as well, um, you said that you and your wife really have made no firm decisions about the long-term use of this property. Is that correct? That's correct. 
I will say how the only long-term decision we've made is, and people ask us, you going to flip it, Chris? The answer is no. If you want to ask me, will I own this property 10 years from now? Without hesitation, if I'm alive, I will own it. Will you rent it? Uh, the short-term answer to that is I do intend to rent it because I am not moving out of my house in the short term. Uh, I'm also looking at that draft response, and you say in it uh, that although sleeping is the same matter no matter where it's done, uh, the cubes will only serve as a sleeping space when the primary structure's capacity is inadequate. Can you give me an example of how this might ordinarily arise in the course of the use of this property, particularly on a rental basis? Well, the, the big question on a rental point of view is whether you're renting uh, annually or seasonally. Uh, if you're renting annually, I think you're talking about a one or two person kind of affair because the only other people who would be there would be children, and I'm not into renting. It's not going to be a college situation. I think, I think you're, you're missing the point of my question. You, you, you say in here that the cubes will only serve as sleeping space when the primary structure capacity is inadequate. I'm asking you to give me an example of when that inadequacy would occur, especially in a rental situation. Well, if there's a renter and they have guests come stay with them, they, I, I envision that somebody's not going to use the cube as their bedroom and not the primary structure. So if somebody's renting the primary structure and they have guests come, that would be a perfect situation for them to stay in one of the cubes. Short-term rental versus long-term rental? Same thing? I, I, I would say roughly the same thing, yes. Can the, the offending cube be moved beyond? Uh, these cubes uh, can be moved. Anything can be moved. But I can say that I anticipate no eventuality when they would be moved. Right. But so right now they could be put within the correct 20, within that 25 foot set. No, they cannot. They could not be. No. If, if you did that, you would, the cubes would be on top of the house. And I'd be back here asking for a variance. And are the cubes connected to the main structure by a roof structure? Uh, we went to significant trouble to make sure that the cubes are freestanding and are not connected to the deck or the house. And just to follow up a question that I had with... Um, Why did you do that? Because uh, I was advised by the code enforcement officer that they have to be separate standalone structures. I said, well, certainly we could, we could certainly put, you know, have the, the, the deck and the cubes use the same sauna tubes. And uh, the code enforcement officer said, no, that would not be a separate structure. You have to have separate sauna tubes for each. So uh, we have separate sauna tubes for each. There is no connecting point. And just to follow up, so there's no way to have the main structure and the two cubes with an entire setback of 25 or 30 feet, whatever it is in the code? There is not. The reason why we went with this design is because it, it, it enabled us not to tear down the building, and it, it added a small amount of square footage. Again, think from that ribbon to that ribbon, uh, in a very pleasing way. Apple tree, uh, uh, Tom Egan, in his email conceded that this was a nice design. It works well. It looks good. If I had torn it down and put up a two-story structure that towered over my neighbor, I'm sure nobody would be happy with that, although it'd be perfectly, I mean, we wouldn't be here tonight. It looks good. It will look good. Do you have a picture of what it's supposed to look like? I do not. Do you have um, a, a drawing with you of the lot and where the instructions are supposed to be on the lot? Uh, I did not bring anything of that sort. I'm sorry. Can, is it possible, notwithstanding your comments earlier, that there are separate, three separate structures? Is it possible to connect the three structures with the roof or some other stru uh, structure? No, there's not. Then the, if I connected them, then they wouldn't be separate structures. They okay. have to be separate. Um, I'm not, 
agreeing or denying that point, um, um, conceptually, can the, the, the three um, structures be connected and would the plan still work? Is it physically possible? Uh, well, anything's physical. You know, yeah, right. Right, so the theory is that notwithstanding the comments, conversations that you've had with the code enforcement officer, that they need to be separate, can the three structures be um, structurally tied together? Yes. And still be pleasing to you? I, I think that there's a scenario under which that could happen, and, I, and that was discussed. All right, and, and if that structure was the three independent structures became one, yes, you are still over the setback of 25 feet. You're still, oh, oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, it does not work without the setback. I have a question for Ben. Do I ask that now? Or later? Um, if this proposal had come in sort of de novo as a structure, not as two cubes added onto the house, but I wanted, I bought this lot, I want to put this house with these two cubes on it. Do you understand my question? Yes. Um, would that have made any difference in whether or not you approved it? No, it wouldn't. If you, yeah, you could come in with a proposal to you have a, a lot and you're building from scratch and you propose a primary structure and two accessory structures with, with one permit. The accessory structures less than 150 square feet have the setback reduction from 25 feet to 15 feet. So we've, there's been a lot of discussion of that. Uh, so when Mr. Bond came in uh, with his permit to build the two accessory structures, each less than 150 square feet, uh, and we talked about the setback requirements. Uh, he then subsequently came in with the permit for de for decks, and I told him that you don't get the you don't get the setback you don't get the reduced setback if you attach decks to these structures because then they would become more than 150 square feet. And, and hence the conversation that we had with Mr. Bond as to why they need to be separate. Yes. And does it matter, would it matter to you, would the size of the bedroom in the house matter to you? If it had three huge bedrooms? No, I, I, I don't think it would matter. What, what, it would matter that the house had all the components to be a dwelling unit. Be, and, and that's been discussed here as well. If you, you need to have the primary residence, the primary dwelling unit, in order to have those be accessory uses. I had a follow-up question, Mr. Bond. Have you um, requested commentary from um, your neighbors, with, um, obviously with the exception of uh, Apple Tree? Um, did anyone else comment, or did you reach out and speak with them? And, and do you have any? Well, um, it, the, the property we're talking about is right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we have the map um, and the papers with us. Right, it's right here. So uh, I only have one neighbor. I have, I have Mr. Egan, who we know how he feels about this. And, uh, and I, I've got uh, Steve Jordan, who's right next to me. I mean, he, he and I are like this. And he is, I thought he might be here tonight. Uh, I think I can speak for himself, speak for him and say he's very happy. Did, did you get a chance to speak with anyone on, on Beacon? What's that? Um, he's at, he's at yeah, right? yeah, did you speak with them? Thank it's, it's unique. It's a unique little spot. And I think if you put in a big house, it would, it would, it would hurt it. It would, it would take away some of the uh, appeal to the area. Any further questions for Mr. Bond? Thank you.
Um, before we get to rebuttal, is there any public comment from anybody else? Yes, sir. Can you can you come up to the podium? Hi, Mr. Sullivan. I'm a. Uh, I live on Two Lights Road. I I just would make the observation that Mr. Egan's house. I would I would think it's unlikely that he would be able to see this structure from his house. He has a, an, another property that abuts um, with a small house on it, but I, I don't see that his, there would be any visual impact um, up, up, uh, with, these, these, with this, these additional structures. Thank you. Okay, attorney shoots. I just want to point out that. I just interrupt for one second. Sure. Just in case anybody's here for the fifth item on the agenda, which is the request of Edward and Sybil McCarthy, that has been um, continued until next meeting. So just in case anybody's sticking around for that. You can go on. Sure. I mean, I think, um, you know. Mr. Bond has essentially said what I've been saying, which is that if you were going to approve these cubes as bedrooms, that's replicating the primary use and would not be permissible. His response to that is to say we may use them for things other than bedrooms. And if that's so, I would just encourage the board to condition any approval on not using these cubes as bedrooms in connection with a commercial rental use. And that way you're keeping uh, options open for residential property owners uh, going forward. But we're not going down the course of having these small cottages converted into multi-bedroom rental types of units. Um, I want to comment on the, the bathroom issue. I mean, our perception obviously is that this can be rented to anyone who can then make use of it without bathrooms attached, that does give us concern about it. Um, there is a garage on this parcel that is restricted by a covenant to non-rental commercial use. I'm hearing that that garage has now been converted to be associated with this rental use. I think we're going to be taking that up with Mr. Bond uh, separately uh, because uh, that garage was built within the setback and as an accommodation between the owners, an agreement was reached to place a covenant on it. I don't know that that's before you, but it's of concern. Um, uh, you know, I think from the code enforcement officer's perspective, my impression is that if it's short of a dwelling unit, the code enforcement might be seeing the, anything that falls shy of being a full-scale dwelling unit as an accessory use, and I would just, you know, I think it's to the, for the board to provide some guidance there to say, look, you know, dwelling unit's one thing, but you can certainly can have um, uses that fall short of a dwelling unit that are not all the way down at a shed with an ex uh, that would qualify as an accessory use. And I think we're there um, in, uh, in this particular case. You know, obviously, under your ordinance, you have all kinds of structures that could be put to uses that are permitted and uses that are not permitted. Um, you can have a structure that could be made into a restaurant or bed and breakfast. You could have the same structure occupied by the owner and lived in. Um, you know, there are enforcement issues that would arise in any instance, but, um, you know, Apple Tree owns a number of lots in this area. We're concerned about property values. We're concerned about changing the character of the neighborhood. We're concerned about expanding these kinds of commercial non-residential rental uses through this sort of accessory unit back door that's being proposed. Uh, thank you for considering our position. Any follow-up questions? Thanks. Uh, there's not any more comment. Um, then I'll close the public comment and argument and uh, open it up for board discussion. This is a little troubling. Uh, I see a, a like, lacuna in the rules. Uh, it also reminds me of the early application where uh, we denied a variance where they can actually have a accessory structure in that space. Let's disconnect it. Um, why is that no? Uh, th that doesn't apply to the front setback, but the setback. The, setback, uh, the side uh, setbacks can be less than the front. Correct. 
Um, and the way I look at the definitions, uh, these cubes are not a dwelling, uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, I mean, they're not a, an accessory building or structure? Or they're not an accessory dwelling unit? Well, I'd look at two points. Um, There was a definition about uh, it had to have a bathroom and a cooking facility and sleeping arrangements. Dwelling unit. Dwelling That's an accessory dwelling unit yeah. as opposed to an accessory building or structure, which and, is what these and, are. Right. And so when I look at the accessory dwelling unit, it has to be somehow connected, if you will. That's the concept that I was thinking of there. So if it's, as we discussed, what happens if you just have a shed? Is that okay? I mean, I think... Yes, right? Yes. So the only issue that I see is that potentially people could sleep in this cube. That's, that's kind of where I'm, the way I'm conceptualizing it is the argument seems to be nobody's allowed to sleep there. And, and that's why I, to call, what, what are we, we're calling it a bedroom or not, they're, they can be used for a number of different reasons. They can be used for a number of different uses are we supposed to make some finding that they can be used for a number of different uses, but nobody shall ever sleep in one of these cubes? Because w when does it become a bedroom? And, and the other thing that, at least in my mind, is the fact that the one full bath or the one three-quarter bath is only accessible via the bedroom in the primary structure to me, it seems highly unlikely that those two cubes will ever be used full time as bedrooms because every time that somebody has to take a shower, you have to go through the primary bedroom. It's just, it's unlikely that a family of five or six would want to live for any length of time in these three cubes when there's one bathroom and it's accessible through the master suite. It, it, to me, it seems like these are truly would be incidental to the primary structure. Well, I go the other way on that. I, I find the fact that the septic system uh, expansion is totally indicative that that's what these are going to be used for. They're going to be used for bedrooms, and that's not an incidental use. Uh, so you're, I mean, but that's basically. So you're just discounting the testimony. I mean, so, so part. I mean, I think we're, we're basically making. It's we not have to. There's no testimony. What we have here is conjecture about. Well, it's not. Well, I. Occur. I mean, we're. I mean, we're fact finding. Part of what we're doing now is, is fact finding and actually making. Mr. Bond couldn't tell us what he was going to use these for for certain. That, that's fine. I'm going to step in on the the septic system. I, mean, I, I don't know what the state of it was, you know, X number of years ago, but when somebody needs to replace a septic system, they would replace the, I think, a forward-thinking person would say, oh, I'm going to spend tens of thousands of dollars doing a system, I'm going to build it for, for three bedrooms, because that gives them a lot of potential in the future to change that, to expand that house. So I wouldn't, I understand where you're coming from, but I, w I wouldn't look at it the same way, that it was done for that purpose. I mean, my, my view is we are, I mean, part of, at least for this appeal, is, is making factual determinations. And I take at face value that we've heard testimony that there isn't a decision in terms of how that those structures will be used. And we have no evidence. Well, I mean, the evidence we have is the testimony. The testimony provides no specific evidence. It, so you can't make a determination based on a lack of evidence. I mean, the, the testimony, it, we can take the testimony. It's, the testimony is the testimony. It's what he stated. I mean, we're not going to have, we're not going to have any... specific that are offered to us here on that particular issue. What we do have is an admission that certainly the bedroom use is contemplated at least some of the time. That was testified to. That's true. Okay. And the question here is, is it bedroom use incidental? such structures, and I, I simply can't find that to be true. Uh, 
so I asked earlier about the setbacks and if the entire if both the structure if all three structures were contained within the setback or you know outside of the setbacks I guess um, it would all be we wouldn't be here right now if they're all if, well maybe we still be here um, but basically if all three structures are within the setbacks or I'm sorry you know what I mean. Um, if we were talking about, if it was 25 feet from the property line, we wouldn't be having this issue, I don't think, because then we could say they are dwelling units and they are bedrooms and that's okay. It wouldn't matter what they It wouldn't are. matter because right. we'd have a septic system, they'd be up to the code, you know, there's no plumbing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's why I asked, can he move one or two? And I don't see why he could. We don't have plot plans, but it seems like that could be the sticky point here. Because I also agree that he's going, he's really contemplating them being used as sleeping quarters. And I think it kind of skirted the idea, skirted the idea of setbacks and said, oh, it's a accessory structure. Now it can be 15 feet away instead of 25. But I don't buy into the, the commercial that it's going to be Motel 6. I mean, with the way the bathrooms are set up, that's, he's not going to separately rent each of these things. Well, then that, that, may, that may be yeah. the case. We don't know. Right. Okay. But we also have to think in terms of uh, future situations that arise. And Clearly, uh, if, if this were to arise in, a, in, in the future again, and you came up with somebody that puts four pots down, or somebody puts five pots down, somebody puts three pots down with a shower, without a shower, with a half bath. Ben, what would prevent, or would anything prevent, the current owner or future owner from putting bathrooms into the two pods? The, the size of them would prevent it. They're, Just, they're, they're 12 by 12 structures, and you couldn't, you, you wouldn't have room to both put a bed and a bathroom in a 12 by 12 structure. What if you went up? I mean, what if suddenly you, there were two stories? You, you, you wouldn't have room for a stairwell in a 12 by 12 structure unless it was, an, I suppose, I mean, an exterior stairwell. I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of like. If the, the structure was larger, uh, I don't see anything preventing a bathroom from going in there. If it was larger. If, it, if the structure was larger, it's... That it's be a, then it couldn't fit into accessory structure because it'd be over 150 square feet. Well, no. The, I think the, the setback issue is confusing this on, on some levels. And I think Apple Tree, regardless of the setback, I think Apple Tree still has a problem oh, cool. with accessory structures being used in this manner. Uh, and. It's the, an accessory structure can be a 40 by 40 garage is, is an accessory structure. So the size of it is just to, just buys him five feet of, of setback is the only thing that the size does. And you mentioned the apple tree. What you meant to say was Mr. Bob. No, I, no, I, I, I think apple tree still has a problem with the, with the use of these structures whether they're 15, 20, or 25 feet from the property line. They would still be challenging the structures. They, they would still be challenging the structures if they met the 25-foot setback because they have a, a, a theoretical problem with an accessory structure being used in this manner. So, sorry to put you on the hot seat here. Uh, on the lot now, there is a garage that's detached from the main structure? Yes. And theoretically, one cube could be within the 25-foot setback, not the two. I'm sorry. So, right. One of the problems that we're having is that we don't have a plan as to what these things are going to look like, or a, a drawing to say where it's going to be on the, on the land itself. So I'm trying to receive information this evening, and I'm, I'm, there's some conf conflicting details here. I'm trying to reconcile what's the lowest common denominator and that is the garage and the main structure, full stop, it, it, as it is right now. To increase within the setbacks so that there's no dispute between the uh, apple tree and potentially the um, Mr. Bond, is that there could be one cube within the setbacks, so not within the setbacks, that do not um, uh, go over the, essentially 25 feet away from the side of the property. Right, so the, the issue when it come, becomes that there are two cubes, is that correct? And so to get them spatially aligned, they, they go into the setbacks of 25 feet. Correct. So with, I'm trying to grapple with whether there's a solution that, oh, 
So you have a map. Um, the, the, well, the, this is the building permit, the, the building permit application. Okay. Yeah. This, right. is, this is the septic system. Okay, so what, what, what's the distance between the main structure and that first unit there, the first cube? It looks like about six feet. So theoretically, that, that could be attached to the main structure. Yes. But it would. It, it, go ahead. But then it, it would. I, I, I guess, I, just to back up, kind of. Considering hypotheticals about where else this can go, yes. I mean, there was a permit that was granted. It's yes. being appealed. So either the permit shouldn't have been granted or it should have. All I mean, enough aren't, we, are, aren't we kind of getting a little bit far afield of, well, how else could the house be reconstructed or an addition? Who cares? Under the ordinance, there's a, there appears to be in the corner because it doesn't fit within the definition of the dwelling or the accessory dwelling. But when you get into the concept of have someone sleeping in one of those cubes and having a subject system large enough to, to cover those two, uh, two, two cubes, it seems more likely than not that it, it's a, a way to get a larger structure there but, but have them separate, if you will. Well, I mean, well, we've heard testimony that if they just wanted a larger structure, they could have torn the house down and rebuilt a larger structure. So the, the decision wasn't, it, it, to me at least, what I'm hearing is this wasn't done to try to generally get around um, prohibitions in the ordinance from having additional square footage on the lot. It was simply to maintain the existing structure as it is because it's a cute house from 1960, yeah. but then also to add some additional useful space. So they, again, if they wanted to, they could have torn the house down and built something that might have been 2,000 square but feet. They, well, I, I can't recall the provision, but when you do a reconstruction or a replacement, right, it has to be within the footprint or the normal setbacks that, that would allow a single family dwelling in that location, right? Correct. So when we use that analysis, that, that doesn't, it's not exact to the situation here, because what happens is that if you replace that home with a larger home, you still have to use the 25-foot setbacks. Is that correct? Yes. So, so that's one scenario. So to completely re uh, remove and replace it, you have to do a 25-foot setback. If you leave it alone and maintain the main structure and then add two additional cubes, you're not subject to the 25-foot setback. Correct. Right. Well, that, there's a notable dif difference between those two points, then. Well, but but if they re if they did a reconstruction, yes, they could have added a second story. No doubt. So, I, I guess I'm. Um, what? It's the what's issue. Your concern? The, to get the benefit of five feet of the setback, they have to be separate structures. Yes. And. Those separate structures are not supposed to be dwelling units unless they are attached. If I understand the logic here, but, but they're not dwelling units. They're, it's accessory. They're an ex the argument is they're an accessory structure. Yes, and then we get into the, what's the primary use versus a subsidiary use. Right, which I think is ultimately. I mean, the way this is shaking out in my head is there's. I mean. That's that's the determination. Is are is the is is the board the board needs to make a determination whether or not these are accessory structures or not. I mean, I think that's really what it boils down to. to because they're on sonotubes, does it matter to you in your analysis that it's a three season home, a three season cube, not a four season cube? Where does it say they can't be used for sleeping? It, that's just an argument that's being made that... Where, why, why is there any basis at all for that argument? Because it's a question of whether or not there's an incidental use here for this structure. It doesn't say that it can't be sleeping. Well, is sleeping an incidental use or not? Or is it, in fact, part of the primary use of it? Well, I mean, I think the, the argument that's being made is that and it, uh, sleeping is not an accessory use. 
Well, it seems to me, you know, again, again, this is, we're debating, you know, the head of, what's on the head of, I mean, this is about the word incidental. Um, and there's nothing, you know, this, this is, this would seem to be permissive. It's like you can do these things, um, but you can't do a commercial machine shop. There is, there is nothing here that necessarily says you can't do all the other things you'd have in the house. This is like in addition to what you could do in the no, house. No, actually, actually there, there is. There's nothing that prohibits it. There is, because if you go down further and look at the accessory dwelling unit, you get into that issue. And that's what Matt was looking at. That's for a single subordinate dwelling. These aren't dwelling. That's there's, correct. There's no question that's that. Correct. Well, but no, that's the issue. Whether they are in fact dwelling units because there is, in fact, a primary use of the house being made in those structures. Yeah, but they aren't separate dwelling and they don't have a kitchen and a stove and all those things. They're, they're just not accessory dwelling. They're just not accessory dwelling. Nor I mean, could they, they ever become one. Nor could they become one. Well, but they could become one. There's not enough space. There are 150 square feet. But also, as far as sleeping goes, are there degrees of sleeping? Um, in that there's a primary residence, and then there's an attached bath, there's a kitchen, there's a fridge, there's a washer and dryer, and the garage is next door to it, and so forth. Somebody lives in that, then they have guests, and the guests sleep in these really three season, not, you know, not winterized, um, um, 12 by 12 rooms that are located a few feet well, away. Well, actually, they are way through us because they were well, okay. yeah. right. But as far as just, they're on stuff on tubes, and so they're not, you know, it's not quite the same as, as um, well, a February day here. Um, but anyway, it doesn't, is there a difference between sleeping year round as like a primary, a primary residence almost, or is it just, hey, we're having friends over and they're staying the night, or we're renting a cottage for a week in the summer and having our overflow guests stay in these things? I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not asking, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Again, it seems to me we've kind of bought book, line, and sinker, this argument that it's, it has to be a restrictive interpretation of the ordinance. It's like, wait a minute, no it doesn't, number one. Number two, I go back to my earlier statement, I mean, if this can all just, if we're having all these debate, and the answer is, okay, the next guy in the door, just don't call him sleeping. When somebody asks you what you're going to do with it, it's going to be a garden shed. It doesn't say how long it has to be a garden shed. A month. I take the garden tools out and I put a bed in. You're not regulating the structure. You're not regulating where it is. You're not regulating what it looks like. You're not regulating anything about what you're building, which is pre presumably what we have responsibility to do because that's what impacts the neighbors. Well, yeah, you're not regulating one of those that's, things. That's why you look to the uh, other factors that went into this. And, and the key factor for me, as I said before, is the septic system expansion. You wouldn't have to do that if, in fact, you didn't have that in mind in the future. Well, I mean, unless, like Aaron said, you're, you, need to, you need to build a new septic system, you're gonna build a larger one to give, your more, give yourself more options if in case you decide to tear the house down and build a new one. I mean, then you don't have to go and redo that's, that's, septic that's, system. That's right, and, and certainly you could take one of these cubes and you could have sleeping in one cube, and you could turn the other cube into two bathrooms. There's enough space for that. You could do the same thing if you built them as a garden shed. Well, actually, no, because if you built it as a garden shed, you wouldn't have to ask, get the uh, expansion on the septic system. I mean, if you originally built it as a garden shed. If you originally built it as a garden shed, you wouldn't have expanded the septic system to accommodate. Could, could a bathroom go in an, in an accessory structure, based on your theory? Well, how about if we put a bathroom and a kitchen in one accessory structure and a bedroom, two bedrooms in the other? Or just one bedroom? Yeah, that did. What do we got now? What's the animal now? It seems to me we still have a duck here, <laughs> as you were saying. Uh, we've got bedrooms, and, and they're, they're part of the principle we use of the it, it, you know, for me, this really boils down to what what can an accessory structure be used for, and and, and, and you know, currently we allow many uses in accessory structures. I have a stack of files back there of accessory structures that are used for sleeping space, uh, you know, living space, bathroom space. As long as it doesn't comprise a dwelling unit, as long as it doesn't become a dwelling unit. Uh, 
it's allowed to be in, a, in an accessory structure. I mean, that's, that's currently how, how the ordinance has been interpreted. I mean, if, if, if that's the interpretation of the, ordinance, or, or the ordinance, and again, I also keep coming back to, we've heard testimony that the use of these pods has, is yet to be determined. I, I can't disregard that. I, I take that at face value. And so I, we don't know what's going to be in these structures. It could be a home office. It could be, who knows what's going to be done with these pods. Will somebody be sleeping in them at some point sometime? Probably. But to me, that doesn't suddenly make them, take them out of the realm of accessor, accessory building or structure. Yeah, and it's hard to penalize the applicant for upgrading their septic system because they could have come in and said, I, I'd like a permit for two accessory structures, a den, and an art studio, and I'm just going to replace a one-bedroom septic system. And it would have been less costly for them to, and, and a lot of people do skirt the septic rules by calling it something different. So it's hard for me to penalize the person for being forward thinking about their septic. And if, if we um, grant the appeal and overturn the permit, and then they apply, the bonds apply again, and they say we are building two workshops, where are we then? That's my question. Can't, I mean, at that point, we don't we, have to approve those because they are clearly accessory buildings or structures. They said the right words. So I, I, I just, I mean, we can. I get a sense that everybody may or may not have made up their mind. I know where I stand on this. I think if somebody wants to make a motion, or I'm kind of, <laughs> I think we've kind of beaten this into the ground. Unless anybody else has any comments or discussions, I think we should close discussion and see if we can have a motion. Um, I just want to revisit one particular point, and may we close then? Thank you. Person. On the definition of accessory building or structure, um, this is in the definition of 1913 on page two. Uh, there's a reference to a detached subordinate building, the use of which is clearly incidental and related to that of the principal building or use of the land, which is located on the same lot as the principal building or use. For residential uses, Accessory buildings and structures shall include, but not limited to, the following. And there's, a, there's a list. The way I read hard facts of the, of the code, the, the cubes can go within the setback 25 feet. So as, as currently approved, I, I think it should be approved as well. In other words, um, reject the application by Apple III. Re reject the appeal. Yes, reject the appeal just because the, that definition um, is broad enough to include the, the cubes. And I'm troubled with the definition of a dwelling unit, uh, further pages over, is that it has to, a dwelling unit requires cooking, sleeping, and toilets all in one structure. That's why I, was, I asked whether, can there be a roof over all three objects? And the answer is no. So it's, it, by definition, it, it's not a dwelling, dwelling unit. And again, we've, what we've heard from Ben is, I mean, what you're saying is this, these two are mutually exclusive. An accessory, if it's not an accessory dwelling unit, it's an accessory building or structure. Is that, is that generally what yes, the history it, of? It, it's not an accessory dwelling unit. It's not a dwelling unit. It's an accessory building or structure, in my opinion. Any further board discussion? Okay, close board discussion. Anybody have a motion? We reject the appeal. Anybody second that? I second the appeal. Okay. I second the motion. Um, any discussion? Any discussion on the motion? Okay. Um, so, all in favor of the motion to um, reject the or deny the administrative appeal. 
Okay, so it's four to one, and the administrative appeal is denied. Um, <laughs> against? <laughs> four, four, four in favor of denying the administrative appeal of Apple Tree Cottage LLC at 44 Southeast St. Lucie Boulevard. Wait. Oh, okay. Um, of Apple Tree Cottage LLC of 44 Southeast St. Lucie Boulevard, Stewart, Florida, of the Code Enforcement Officer's decision to approve building permit 150525. Um, findings of fact on August 21st, 2015, the Code Enforcement Officer approved building permit 150525 to construct two 12 feet by 12 feet accessory structures at 15 Sunrise Drive, map U14, lot 38. On September 18th, 2015, Apple Tree Cottage LLC submitted an administrative appeal of this permit. The subject property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. Um, additional findings of fact. Um, I mean, I think the one additional finding of fact that I would propose we make is that the, uh, the, the two 12 feet by 12 feet structures are accessory structures pursuant to 1913 of the uh, code of the ordinance. But I'm open to some discussion in terms of what other findings. I, I mean, I, I I'm wondering if we need more findings and what what findings we need to support well, I, support the denial. Let me ask this. This is a question. Um, since it's an appeal, um, can't we just say we support Ben's findings? This isn't like we're doing a variance to the code. We're just yes, saying, sir. you're the technician, looked like a duck to you, to that. I, I think if we go beyond that and we start making our sure. own yep. decisions, you know, you're kind of opening yourself up to a lawsuit or we're not finding but you're opening facts. yourself up. Right. And Ben's, we're saying, we, we've heard all the stuff, we've heard all the facts, we support. Okay. I, I, As a counterbalance to that point, I would just, if we're going to have other findings, whether the certain other definitions in the code would, do not apply. So we, we do talk about the 1931 section, but why the other two sections don't apply? I, you know, I think, I, I kind of tend to feel that Ben made the determination that there are accessory structures. The appeal was arguing that they're not accessory structures and we're denying it. So it's basically that it, we're, we're standing on Ben's approval and issuance of the permit. With, with respect, Mr. Chairman, I believe that your responsibility is the de novo review. So you have to review this as though you were sitting in Ben's shoes and deferring Ben's findings will clearly lose upon appeal by having Thank you. Thank you. Based on my past history on this board, that um, comment is well taken. <laughs> um, we've, we've been overturned before based on our standard of review. And if this is in fact a de novo review, um, we should not defer to Ben's findings of fact. Best we'll be back here in a year. So, um, Mr. Bond has uh, submitted some proposed findings and conclusions, so I would suggest we at least initially work off of these, um, and we can tweak these. Um, does everybody have a copy of them? Um, I'm just, I'm just going to read. I'm going to start reading through these. I'm not. I don't think we need necessarily all of them. But um, so finding number one, uh, Christopher Bond is the owner of the property located at 15 Sunrise Drive. The property is located in the R8 zone. Um, I think that's already in there. So that that's that's kind of covered by findings of fact three that we already. Um, 
uh, found. Uh, 15 Sunrise Drive abuts property owned by Apple Tree Cottage LLC. Um, I think that's fine. Um, the house of 15 Sunrise Drive was built in the early 60s. I don't think we need, um, I mean, unless others disagree, I'm not sure we need kind of this history um, of Sunrise Drive and when it was built and the size of it. We would probably skip ahead to number eight, I would think. You'd, you'd suggest skipping to eight? Um, let me just, the house does not. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, so, or, or we can even make that uh, they've been we determine them to be accessory structures. Say that again. It, we, can't we just say that we determine them to be ex accessory structures? We determine that they are accessory structures. I, I mean, I think that's sort of what it comes down to. In my mind is, do we need some? Do we want to have some support in the findings for why they're accessory structures? And and I, I'd like to at least I would suggest that we incorporate some findings as to why. No um, sleep, uh, So I think if we were to jump down to eight, which is the 12 by 12 foot structures were not designed to be bedroom only buildings. Um, the 12 foot by 12 foot structures were designed to add space for unforeseen, unanticipated or incidental use that will augment the small primary structure. Anticipated but not def definite uses include but are not limited to sleeping space home entertainment space, home office space, hobby space, general living space. I mean, just kind of as an aside, I don't mind adopting some of these because this is what was proposed by Mr. Bond. And if these findings ultimately are overturned, it, this is, you know, this is, this was his suggestions. Um, but I don't think we need all of them. So I, I, I like number eight and number nine. Um, I don't think we need 10. Um, I don't think we need 11. So I would propose um, including eight and nine as findings. And um, I do like, um, you know, again, I, you know, conclusion A is the 12 by 12 foot structures may not be used or rented independently of the principal structure. I mean, I like that on principle, but I'm not sure, do we need to go there and sort of put in additional restrictions? They're restricted as they're restricted under the ordinance and the use is under the ordinance. So um, I do like B, the 12 by 12 foot structures are clearly incidental and related to that of the principal building or use of the land. Um, I don't think we need C or D. Um, Um, I think G, um, helps support the, um, board's finding or. I think you're mixing the conclusions that are reached. I, 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 I was just thinking that I think, um, might add G as a finding. All right, let's try this. So these are the additional findings and stop me if anybody disagrees. Um, so we have one, two are already there. So is the, the 12, so I'm going to go back. The finding of fact, number one, on August 21st, 2015, the code enforcement officer approved building permit 150525 to construct two 12 by 12 foot accessory structures at 15 Sunrise Drive, Matt U14, Lot 38. On September 18th, 2015, Apple Tree Cottage LLC submitted an administrative appeal of this permit. 
Three, the subject property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. Additional findings of fact. The 12 by 12 foot structures were not designed to be bedroom only buildings. That's number four. Number five, the 12 by 12 foot structures were designed to add space for unforeseen, unanticipated or incidental use that will augment the small primary structure. Anticipated but not definite uses include, but are not limited to sleeping space, home entertainment space, home office space, hobby space, and general living space. Uh, that's number five. Number six, um, without the 12 by 12 foot structures, the principal building is entirely functional and able to service the needs of one or two people at most. However, with the accessory structures, the property will have adequate space for incidental living and sleeping requirements, including as they may arise, hobbies, home entertainment, home office when needed, and guest family sleeping space. I think I would stop there. other than to say that the board finds, I guess the conclusion would then be the board finds that the 12 by 12 foot structures meet the definition of accessory building or structure um, in the town's ordinance. So all in favor of those additional findings and that conclusion. So four in favor and one opposed. Okay, I think we can wrap that one up. Uh, the next issue is number three, to hear the request of John M. and Sue Ann Higgins for a variance to construct a 26 foot by 26 foot garage addition to their single family dwelling at 15 Vernon Road, map U19, lot 7-34. Mr. and Mrs. Suzanne Higgins. Mr. Maxwell, before you begin, um, Mr. Maxwell is uh, my neighbor. Oh, sorry, Mr. Royal, thank you. Is my neighbor. Um, he lives um, four or five homes away from me. Um, if that's an issue, I can step out to the audience, otherwise I'll listen to them. I can't hear what he's saying. Do you feel like you can be impartial? Yes, Mr. Royal is a so. builder uh, standing uh, with the, uh, the owner and applicant. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Sue Ann Higgins, and I live at 15 Vernon Road, where we've lived for 47 years. Um, <clears throat> the neighborhood is 50-plus years old. Uh, we are asking for a variance to build a 26 by 26 foot garage. I have pictures of all the houses in the neighborhood. We currently are the only house without a garage. And as you can see, the garages were built with the var when the variance was at 15 feet. The majority of them are at 15 feet. There's a couple that are at 25. No, they had to get a variance. But at any rate, we, um, our request is to have a 26 by 26 foot garage. It doesn't all need the variance, isn't that? It's just part of it. Because what you're I, asking for is a three foot variance. Okay. I didn't know I was going to be doing this tonight, so this is off the cuff. But at any rate, um, as far as the size of the garage, um, I'm a nurse, my husband's a PSS, we are caregivers to the elderly, and we do have wheelchairs and walkers, and that 24 inches in the garage makes a huge difference if you're using medical equipment. Um, there isn't any other option to put the garage, and I'm not sure if I need to answer any questions or... So it's the variance is it's a it's three feet it's from the side feet. setback. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm hearing impaired, so he has to tell me what you're saying. So you're asking for a three foot setback. Okay. On a side yard. So. 
so on that, so if we're looking at the house from Vernon Road, um, the garage will be on the right side of the house. Yes. And so um, what will the setback be after that? After It'll be 22 feet. 22 feet, and the setback is 20. It's 25. And what, do you have any idea what the setback, the current setback of that neighbor on the right is? Like, are they very close to their line? How far away they're from their line, do you think? Could you have Mr. Or, I guess, I guess there's the neighbor to the right. Yes. Yeah. Are they? Oh, they're 15 feet to the pro, or 18 feet to the property line. Okay. From the house to the property line. Ah, thanks. The neighbor to the right. Included in the packet is a letter from that abutting neighbor. I had a question. On, is there an overhang on the side of the garage to the right of the home? It looks like there's, is that less than five feet or less, what's the point five from the edge of the property? Is there an overhang on the, on the house? On the, on the garage. On the garage, no, yeah. no, there's no overhang. On the gable end, you mean? Yeah. No, it's going to be flush. I do have a full-size copy of the survey if anyone's having trouble reading the smaller version. said that he had a full-size copy. Oh, no. yeah. If anybody would like to see it. They have four copies. So in the application, it says there will be no adverse effect to the uh, natural environment. This, there's no trees that are being taken down. No, or... there's some shrubbery that are, is beside the house that will have to come down, but there's no yeah. ah, trees. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, on the first, sorry, it's the first picture after the, mm -hmm. so there's a car and then there's a shed behind the car. Got it. Um, the shrubbery is that pine tree in the corner of the house. It looks like a pine tree. There's a lilac tree. And then these over here. Is that the right? This is a 15. Fire and lilac. Yeah. All right, there's a large cherry tree here. Oh, it's not going to be charged. That's, yeah. That's going to stay. Okay. Thank you. Do we know if these these other um, garages are also are non-conforming? Do they also? The majority of them are. Okay, thank you. Did I answer that correctly? They are not conforming. They are non-conforming. Right. So yeah. they. Which they, meant to you they're. They encroach into the into right. The They're at the 15 feet that when our neighborhood was built, that's what it was. I think that man just told me I had. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you. Uh, any public comment? Okay, hearing no public comment, I'd like to open it up to board discussion. Um, 
I'll just start by saying that I, I think this is a, a complete application for a, uh, a variance. Um, it's very similar to variances that we have uh, granted in the past, particularly for garages that are, you know, encroach a small amount um, into a side setback. Um, and uh, based on the ample evidence that's been provided about other homes in the area, um, this looks very much uh, in keeping with the nature and character of the neighborhood, and I would be in favor of granting the variance. I agree. Would somebody like to make a motion? Move to approve the request of uh, John M. and Sue Ann Higgins for a variance to construct an attached garage in their home at 15 Vernon Road, map U19, lot 7 34. The new construction is proposed to be 22 feet from the side property line, while the zoning ordinance requires 25 feet. Somebody second that? Second. Any board discussion on the motion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor? So that passes 5 0. We'll now read the findings of fact. John M. and Sue Ann Higgins are the owners of the record of property located at 15 Vernon Road, map U19, lot 734. The subject property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. The zoning ordinance section 19-4-3A1A requires the side setback to be 25 feet. The proposed expansion of the principal structure will be 22 feet from the side property line. <clears throat> Additional findings of fact. The need for a variance is due to the unique, unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. The granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detriment, det, detrimentally affect the use or market value of the abutting properties. The practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. No other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. The granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment, and the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And then the conclusion, there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30 AMRSA, Section 4353-4C. All in favor of those findings of fact and the conclusion? I have nothing. Thank you. And moving on to the last order of business for today, it is to hear the request of Peter and Laura Marston to reconstruct and expand a portion of their non-conforming single-family dwelling at 55 Hannaford Cove Road, map U14, lot 6. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mar Marston. Chair, uh, uh, it's been a busy uh, night for Hannaford Cove Road. These are my neighbors. I know them, so I will recuse myself and sit in the audience. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, we purchased this house in uh, this past June recently, and um, uh, just to give a little bit of brief history, it. Um, the house, uh, the existing dwelling was from 1920. Two sisters owned it. Um, and in 1950, um, part of the dwelling was added on to. Um, in 2009, our current neighbor, uh, whom we bought the home from at 53 Hannaford Cove Road, Eileen Calico, um, we purchased a home from her, and she did some brief remodel to it in 2010. Um, after we uh, purchased the home, we decided that we would like to expand to the existing dwelling, um, given mostly to the fact that the crawl space was exposed ledge and there was no attic at all. So we uh, were looking to add a barn-like structure to the rear of the home with a um, room with living space above. So we're requesting to reconstruct, reconstruct and expand a portion of our non-conforming dwelling based on the fact that there is no other buildable alternative on our lot given the current RP1 
critical wetland buffer at 250 feet, given the fact that our current septic system, which we do not plan on changing, is directly in front of the home, and um, our side setback, of course, um, our existing dwelling is within that setback currently. So the only place that we can expand would be directly out the back of the house. Um, I'd like to note that we are using existing walls, um, a rear doorway to the house, and roof lines for this reconstruct and expansion. Also, our only neighbor that this addition um, would be affecting would be at 53 Hannaford Cove Road, Eileen Calico, and she has written a letter on our behalf. I'm not sure if you guys have received this. I did not include it two weeks ago, but I'll read it and then I can hand it to you guys. It is my understanding that Laura and Peter of 55 Hannaford Cove Road are requesting the opportunity to build an addition to their home. It is also my understanding that the setback is non-conforming. I am the abutter at 53 Hannaford Cove Road. I support the Marston's request and have no concerns regarding their plan or the setback. Oh, you guys got it. Okay. Yeah. And that's part of the record? Ben? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to note that on that part of Hannaford Cove Road, every structure on each side of us um, is substantially larger, including two car garages, um, than our current dwelling. Um, so I do not believe that it would change any character uh, to the neighborhood. Any questions for Mr. Marston? No questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any public comment? Good evening. Notwithstanding my earlier recusal, uh, um, my view is a member of the public, and I'm also a resident on that street. And I, my name is Matthew Caton, for the record, and I support their application. Discussion? I'm in support of this, but I guess I just have one question about about um, in the fine, additional findings of fact number two. The proposed structure will not increase the non conformity of the existing structure. D does it not increase? Because and there's, 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 a, there's, a four, there's a 14 feet, I think. I mean, basically, I don't know, is it, is it, is it actually not, isn't it actually increasing the non conformity because there's more? building along that setback? I, mean, I think we've had this issue come up before and I mean generally the approach that the board has taken is that it's increasing the nonconformity if you're further encroaching into the setback okay. but if you are simply lengthening the structure. There's more encroachment going it's on. It's oh, it, is, it is clearly defined. Thank okay. you, Ben. Um, and this is uh, 
in the definition section, increase in nonconformity of a structure. Um, property changes or structure expansions which either meet the dimensional standards or which cause no further increase in the linear extent of the nonconformance of the ex existing structure shall not be considered to increase nonconformity. Um, so. So, it, it's, where did you, where is the language, the linear extent? Uh, starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There isn't even any common sense balance. So if the, if the original structure was four square feet and the new one's 300, but it doesn't go further into it. That's the ordinance. Okay. Um, any other board discussion? Somebody like to make a motion? To approve the request of Peter and Laura Marston of 55 Hannaford Cove Road. Matt U14, lot six, to reconstruct a non-conforming structure based on section 19-4-3.B.3 of the zoning ordinance. Second. All in favor? So that is approved for to nothing. And where did I put my Findings. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, findings of fact. This is a request of Peter and Laura Marston of 55 Hannaford Cove Road, Map U14, Lot 6, to reconstruct a non conforming structure based on Section 19 4 3 B3 of the Zoning Ordinance. Peter and Laura Marston are the owners of record of the subject lot. The subject lot is a non conforming lot in the RA zone. The non-conforming structure is a single-family dwelling with an on-site on, with an on-site septic system. Additional findings of fact: the Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system, and other on-site soils suitable for septic systems, the impact on views, and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. The proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. And three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent. All in favor of those findings and additional findings? For nothing. And thank you. Um, and the uh, communications update on variety. So the uh, new business number five has been continued to the next meeting and communications update on Verizon appeal. Yeah, the, the short story on the Verizon appeal, there were two parts of the appeal. Uh, was, were the antennas on the water tower allowed by ordinance? And the second part of the appeal was, were they allowed by the Federal Spectrum Act? Uh, the court ruled that they are allowed by ordinance, that the water tower is an alternative tower structure. Um, the court also ruled that uh, it did not qualify under the Spectrum Act. Uh, it's not remanded to the zoning board, so, so it will just continue in its process and be referred to the planning board for additional review. Okay, good. <laughs> um, and uh, with that communication, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> All in favor? We're adjourned.